All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today, I'm delighted to be joined all the way from South Florida by Richard Parker. How are you doing, Richard? I'm doing great. How are you? Excellent, excellent. And Richard's been helping people achieve their dreams of owning a business for over 30 years. His How to Buy a Good Business at a Great Price program has sold over 100,000 copies in 80 countries. Uh, he was hired by the Dalio family and uh, offered them for several years, mentored one of Ray Dalio's, the, uh, the well-known investor, one of the, his sons, teaching him the art of buying small businesses. And you have per uh, personally purchased easy for me to say, personally purchased 13 of his own companies, plus one co-investment uh, with purchase prices ranging from as low as 50,000 to over 200 million. And you've appeared in Forbes, New York Times, The Street Entrepreneur Magazine, and over 200 pu uh, published articles. And what we're going to talk about today is an interesting one. Uh, buying a business in today's economy. Um, so, Richard, just starting out, a lot of people would say, ooh, buying a business in this economy, ooh, probably not the greatest idea, considering nobody knows really what's happening with the economy. What, what say you? Well, your, your, your interpretation of that is 100% correct. Um, you just disappeared. Oh, way. no, that's okay. You continue. Yeah, okay. Well, your interpretation is 100% correct. On the whole, you know, people looking from the sidelines it's a very easy conclusion to draw that, you know, like you said, ooh, like, should I be jumping in now or thinking about this? But the reality is, and I've been doing this for 30 years, we're, we're at a period in time which, which I call beautiful upheaval. There's, mm. you know, there's not blood in the streets per se, but the blood is starting to seep in. And whenever that happens, there's always opportunities. And especially now, and I've gone through a lot of these cycles where, you know, there's been just uh, tremendous dips, <clears throat> excuse me, in the market. And it's usually one or two things, you know, going back 2008, where there's the housing yep. crisis and the world financial crisis. But right now we've got a lot of things at play. For example, interest rates that are um, increasing. We've got inflation, which has uh, risen exponentially, starting to cur curtail a little bit, but it has risen exponentially. There's concern about recession. Um, many prospective buyers or individuals who are thinking about potentially buying a business start to get scared, to your mm -hmm. point. And they and, and that equals less buyers in the market, which in turn equals more of a buyer's market from a mm -hmm. seller's perspective. The other thing, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 continue, sorry. So the the other thing is related to valuations. We've gone through this period where we had went through COVID. And some companies and businesses did terrific during COVID. Mm -hmm. Other ones did terribly and many closed. And then coming out of COVID, it was very hard to measure whether or not, um, you know, the, the businesses as, it's, as it stands today, does, do the COVID years reflect what is current right. or what is going to continue? And this is appropriate regardless. If we we're having this conversation 10 years ago or in, or in 10 years from now, it's very similar because these things, when there is upheaval, it's, it's, it's darn near impossible to put an accurate valuation on a business when you've gone through a, you know, a roller coaster period. And because leverage, it's hard to leverage um, financially the business because of increased um, yeah. interest rates, that equals um, more deals getting done with seller seller notes. So all those bullet points, if you will, in the aggregate equal an advantageous situation to a buyer. And the, the double click from that, if you will, is they're able to put together um, deal terms that are infinitely more advantageous for a buyer and very often performance-based. Mm -hmm. In other words, well... <clears throat> okay, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, I'll pay your price. You have to accept my terms. And those terms are going to be on, are going to be based upon the business, uh, business's performance in the future, which right. is very different than very often when it's a seller's market where you're paying a price and that's the end of it. Right. Um, and, and you're buying the business for what it is now versus mm -hmm. betting on the future and, and gaining the advantage of that. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the great points there so, uh, about the uh, the buyer's market. And so what kind of what kind of businesses do you think are attractive in a climate like this? Or is it across the board? Is it just finding the right business with the right motivated type of seller? 
Yeah, well, that's, that comes up quite frequently. And, and I think it's very important that anyone who's considering, you know, getting into entrepreneurship or, or acquiring a business needs to understand that while there are these short periods of time where there may be certain types of business, businesses that will be better um, through a recession, mm-hmm. you know, history has proven that downturns in the economy last far um, less than um, good, t- good times in the right. economy. Right. So the bad times are, are, are shorter period. Good times last longer. And so I think it becomes a little dangerous for someone to focus um, too much of their attention of saying, I want to buy, you know, a recession proof business. Because if you want to buy a recession proof business, you know, buy a toll booth. So, right. Because other than that, every business is going to go up or down. And I take no credit for that toll booth example. It's a fellow that I worked with for for many years, and he was a tail gunner in World War II, since right. passed away. But that was always his standard line was buy a toll booth if you want a recession free business. And so I think what one, you want to do is you want to take a step back and say, OK, you, you've got to you've got to weigh in a recession, what happens and how that impacts it. But also don't have short term thinking because it, it's very important to stress test what businesses look like coming out of a recession. Mm-hmm. And you can do that because there's, there's you know, historical information related to recessions and what, what businesses have done well coming out. You know, businesses, you know, to go back to the original question, solid, stable, boring, unsexy businesses generally are going to do okay regardless of the economy. Um, certain type of business where there's a, a repetitive nature. Um, if you take a look at some home service businesses, alarm mm-hmm. company, uh, landscaping type businesses, services where you're paying monthly fees to um, to maintain a type of service, generally will do well during during a recession. Yeah, yeah, and it's really interesting what you just said there about also about the terms you can get because. Obviously, in a downturn, sometimes there are people very motivated to sell their business because maybe they just want to get out. But by putting those performance, if you can get performance uh, measures into into the the contract, that then is a little, at least a little bit of a hedge against you know suddenly discovering that the business wasn't that, that viable at all, or that uh, they were just running away before things got really bad. Correct, and it's you know that that philosophy related to um, you know deal terms related to performance. That's why you know I've been teaching and preaching this for for decades. One of the things is to not get so focused on the purchase price and 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 dig yourself a hole that you're mm-hmm. not going to pay more than X because very often and probably most often the terms are more important than the price, and mm-hmm. and similarly. A seller oftentimes has a an idea in their mind of what they want to sell the business for. Now, don't get me wrong. What what business owners generally think their business is worth has nothing to do with the value. It's usually yeah, yeah. never even close. But focusing on the terms rather than um, the actual enterprise value can be so um, so favorable for a buyer. I had a, a, a deal that I worked on a number of years ago and it wasn't a huge uh, purchase. It was, it was my own purchase. It was a little over a million dollars. And I kept coming up with the valuation, but n- couldn't get over $900,000. Mm-hmm. And this, this, this owner, the seller was, was like, there was, there was no budget them related to, um, getting over a million dollars. And I, I just couldn't get my head around it because mm-hmm. it, it, even though it doesn't sound like a big differential, even at nine hundred thousand dollars, it was sure. a stretch, and he was at a million plus. And so, finally, said, "You know what? <clears throat> I'm going to stop looking at the numbers for a second and just have some good casual conversations with this guy." And which is always very important during these 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 uh, the process of buying a business. And found out um, that you know he had already always had this dream, I guess, let's call it bragging rights and, and, and very closely associated to ego that he wanted to be able to tell his buddies he sold his business for a million dollars. Right. right. So I said to him, yeah, no problem. I'll tell you what. And we, and we were looking at the numbers. I said, and we ended up getting up a, a higher price. I said, I'll pay a million two for the business, but I want a 30 year note. Right. Wow. And, 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 um, and he agreed. Wow, and and that's uh, and and I think what you uh, what you outlined there, I think that's a really a really important thing for people, and you'd know better than I would though, is understanding the motivations of the seller and understanding what's important to them, and, and being able to you know work with that as opposed to just you know sitting on opposite sides of a table. And one other thing I was going to ask you about, Richard, is so 
in the in the VC and world and all of that, like over the past like 10, 20 years, whatever it is, especially since the financial crisis or whatever, it's all been take as much money as you can, grow as fast as you can. And uh, and and they pivoted like about a year ago, a year or so ago to suddenly pass to profitability. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of businesses out there now with a lot that are highly, highly leveraged. And, uh, you know, what do, what do you say about businesses like that and, and the difference between a business like that and having a business with great, strong fundamentals? As you said, it might not be as interesting or as sexy or whatever, but it's got good business fundamentals where a lot of these other ones that have taken on tons of money have no business fundamentals. Well, they have no business fundamentals. And from a standpoint of looking that that is an acquisition, I say, let those businesses shit the bed yeah. first. You'll buy them in a couple of years. Right. Yeah. Um, but I agree wholeheartedly with your second point, which is for individuals looking to acquire business, you know, stability is pretty sexy. Mm-hmm. And because that provides you with the platform, and very, most often on the lower in the lower market, and certainly related to individuals buying businesses versus institutional investors like uh, VCs and mm-hmm. um, uh, private equity firms or family offices, the <clears throat> those individuals that could be the biggest investment they ever make into a business. And very often, in most cases, they're first time um, entrepreneurs, first time buyers. And so it's very important to get into a simple business, but one that's incredibly solid, right? The, mm-hmm. the, the whole value of buying an existing business is in theory that you take, you get the keys on Monday, you can take a pe- paycheck on Friday. And right. so leaving aside, you know, the, um, the, let's call it the, uh, I don't even call it excitement. I think that's a bad word, but the yeah. intrigue with, you know, a VC backed business that mm-hmm. has, been, that has generated a lot of investment. I just, it just doesn't hold attraction for me. Like I look at it like the old, uh, you know, the, that old fable, the tortoise and the hare, right? You, you, you're going to get to the finish line in a much better way. If you have a terrific platform on which to, to build. So you get into a simple business that it's easy for you to understand that you can learn and over time grow and build the value of the business over time versus a business, especially getting into one that's got a lot of leverage that you have to take over. And then you're operating with a gun to your head every day. I mean, it's, it's a very, very stressful situation. And especially so for someone who doesn't have, you know, a wealth of operational experience. Yeah. And, and just that with even, even getting into a solid business, one of the things I, I think that often catch people is, is liquidity and cash flow. Right. So one of the things that need to be uh, examined very carefully is to make sure all of the forecasts and predictions are correct. And whether you have a business that gets paid on time or gets paid immediately or gets paid recurring or whether you have to do a lot of chasing of people, because that often bites people when they start their own business, because they look at they go, well, I've got X amount of revenue here, but I've got nothing in my bank account, and now I can't, I can't pay anybody. Or I can't pay for <laughs> can't pay anybody, right? Or yeah. or they, you know, the invent or or they they carry a boatload of inventory in order to satisfy all these sales, and they're always afraid not to make a sale. And so you want to look at your profit. You go into, you know, I they used to be involved in a business, and my my partner and I used to say at the end of the year near Christmas time, we used to look at the warehouse and say, "Here's all our profit, right? If we if we if we put an abrupt stop to the business tomorrow and sell everything in the warehouse at full price, we're immensely profitable, but you keep, you know, the more you sell, the more you buy. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, capital, and this is especially true in startups. I mean, that's the single biggest reason why why startups fail and the failure rate of startups is, 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 is frightening is due to a lack of capital. And so managing those businesses and also individuals that are looking to acquire businesses, I'm dealing with them for years, um, you know, is need to understand that you buy the business, you've got negotiated terms, you have to make sure you have adequate levels of working capital. And that's why part of what, you know, really um, disturbs me today is, um, you know, in, in, in the social media, you just have this pl- proliferation of these alleged gurus selling, um, you know, mastermind groups and, yep. and programs for tens and twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, you know, buying businesses for no money down with throwing off <laughs> six figure cash flow. You can close them in 30 days. And, you know, it's complete bullshit. And part of my language, you know, it's just, yeah. you know, it's so misleading because, okay, great. Let's say you do do that. Well, what happens if you have to buy a piece of equipment? You have no money. 
Yep. I mean, the chances of doing that all together are probably one in a thousand. I'm doing this for years and I've, I've, I've done it once after looking at thousands of, of potential investments. So the keeping in mind that working capital component that you that you reference is critical. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a bit like, uh, unfortunately, the kids these days getting getting caught up in thinking that they can become a YouTuber overnight. Uh, we had somebody local to us who who tried left uh, quit university, tried that, and uh, they're now back at university. Back at university, back at university, living at their parents' house, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, we've seen a good. I mean, we've seen another good example recently uh, with WeWork. You know, just a, a huge example of a company. Uh, just built on massive amounts of investment and overextending themselves and probably not great management. But like you said, when it comes to, I think that is the thing with small business is, it is that idea of sometimes things take longer than you would like. And I think we tend to sometimes be a little more, a little too optimistic. So that's why like looking at, as you're doing your projections, like being very, very kind of conservative in those. Yes. And, and the, the issue that you you noted related to being too optimistic that theory that typically happens more frequently in startups and i always mm -hmm. tell people in startups you know the, the, what's going to happen is the revenue is going to is going to come in half as fast as you anticipated and the expenses are going to be twice as much as you projected yeah the beauty of an existing business is you can pull history right mm -hmm. and now the the past doesn't necessarily equal the future of course, but it gives you some indication, right? Assuming all things remain status quo and you're looking at a business that has two, five or 25 or 75 years of history, you're mm -hmm. able to say that all things remain status quo. Here's what should happen once you take over, as long as you don't change anything. And so right. the being able to look into the past gives you a very good indication related to the future. Now, it may or may not be a good business for the future. You have to do that through your investigation. Yeah. But the financial piece, which is, which is, you know, that's the plasma of a business, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and understanding cash flow. And so being able to look at historically what has happened and stress test that during certain uh, periods of economic growth or decline, there's no better vehicle in entrepreneurship than an existing business to be able to do that. And then just a, a, a last question for you. Uh, how important is it for the, the person who's thinking of purchasing the business to really, to have a good financial sense themselves, like not to outsource all the due, I mean, obviously get people to do, help you with due diligence, but to really understand the financials at a deep level yourself. I mean, I, I think that's kind of a critical thing, but uh, what do you say? It is critical. The good thing related to numbers is numbers don't lie. People lie, not okay. numbers. And so if you don't have this um, uh, great uh, level of acumen related to the financials, it's, it's, it's important, but it's not critical because in that particular, particular component, you can bring in a um, good accounting firm that could really help you with it. That said, you certainly on a going forward basis, if you want, if you're going to be operating a business, you want to be very well versed related to the accounting and the financial piece of the business. And if that requires taking an accounting course, business accounting, it's, it's really important during the financial due diligence of a, of a business review. Yes, it is really important, but that is actually a disagree a little bit because you can uh, hire competent uh, accountants for that because that part that's binary it's numbers it's math you know they they, they don't lie yeah. it's where it's really important in the di due diligence piece that you mentioned due diligence goes way beyond the financials right you have to look at the business and you're going to look at the the industry itself the marketing the sales the employees the the systems in place the processes the procedures the suppliers the customers the competition so on those all of those components that need to be investigated during the due diligence you as the buyer need to be well versed and need to attack it in in a methodical way and it can be done because there's a lot of great resources even related to, to the internet or or attacking it properly I mean our our course, you know, we outlined 200 things that need to be investigated and exactly, you know, how to go about doing it. So the due diligence, very important that people understand it's, 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 it's a, um, it's a whole ball of what has to be investigated because you want to make sure the numbers tell you a certain part, but you want to make sure it's good after you take it over. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Richard, uh, fantastic. And I guess then, uh, 
I guess then the other thing is I, I, I would just say is, uh, you know, good solid expense management. That seems to be, I've always come across, that seems to be something that we're not hardwired for as humans. We're very good on the spending side. We're not so good on the expense management side. Yeah, well, I agree with you wholeheartedly because what happens is, you know what, I think, you know, people's optimism, yeah. right? And especially when you're looking at a new project or whatever, you get past the logic and you get into the emotion and you start to have the delusions of grandeur, mm -hmm. right? Of, of what this can turn into, right? And you start, and like the more you start mentally spending the money, <laughs> the bigger the ball gets, right? Like, is there, yeah. oh, like if I do, if I sell X at Y, it's going to equal Z of that. But if I say X to the power of two times this, and people, you know, you start to hallucinate. Not even yeah. dream you hallucinated what it could be. But you know, the numbers, you got to deal with the expenses because regardless of what happens with the sales, the expenses are going to be there. Yeah. And so taking it, I like to take an uber conservative approach and I do my stress testing when I look at a business and I account for a 25% decline in the business. Oh, wow. And I say, if I can manage the expenses with a 25% decline, now that's radical. But yeah. you know what, what it does is it lets me sleep at night. Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, listen, Richard, this has been fantastic. All of Richard's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. So our, my, I've been in the M&A world for 30 years, and I do uh, some uh, sell-side representation, which really just keeps me busy. But the majority of my time is dedicated to helping individuals acquire businesses. I've been so blessed in my life and um, been able to achieve um, you know, a, a measure of financial success and enjoyment that I never could have dreamt of. And I wrote this material really as just to memorialize all the files that I'd looked at over the years. And my whole goal was, you know, even bef the day before we launched the program, my wife asked me how many think we're going to sell. And my, a and my answer to her then was the same as it is now, which is if I could help one person buy the right business or avoid buying the wrong one, all the work will have been worth it. And I, yeah. so I don't do it in the, for the money. I mean, I'm just stunned how many I've sold of these things, over 100,000 of them. I just, I just get unbelievable joy helping individuals realize their dreams and keep it very, very reasonable and well-priced. And I allow people the opportunity. They can email or call me anytime. I spend my days on the phone with individuals. I never charge them. I just, I just like to see them get to the finish line in a good way because what I've done, I'm not the brightest guy in the room by any means. And what I've done is just from good a level of education and, and getting off my ass and, and you know <laughs> getting into the game with lots of good mistakes. And I call them good mistakes because there's great learning. So, you know, I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, no, but I guess, great. you know, it's like my, I live for helping people buy good businesses. I mean, that's really what I get up um, and, and, and run into my office every day to do. Yeah, well, I would encourage you to go check it out. You can hear the passion there from from Richard and the track record and the fantastic advice you've shared during this, uh, during this podcast. So I, I would encourage you to go check it out. So thank you again, Richard. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.